Um, this talk is by Vic Parachuri, who is a machine learning consultant. That was an excellent pronunciation of my last name. Um, I'm Vic Parachuri. Um, I I'll work at edX. I'm going to reintroduce myself, apparently. Um, and today, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of automated scoring. Um, so before we start, um, I just want to let you know that this presentation is on GitHub. So if you want to be super cool and follow along, feel free. Um, and that also helps because it'll let you grab the links as, as I go along. Um, and, and if you have any questions afterwards, my email is up there. Feel free to contact me. OK, so what is edX? edX is an educational nonprofit created in 2012. We were founded by MIT and Harvard. And since then, we've added a lot more schools. Um, we have a learning management system and a content management system. And both of these allow us to deliver courses to thousands, hundreds of thousands of students. Um, I know there are edX people in the audience that are immediately going to correct me on these numbers, but I believe we hosted 30 courses so far, and we have an equal number upcoming. We're currently hiring. I was told several times to say that, so work for edX, guys. Um, and all of our software is open source and in Python. So when edX launched um, all of a year ago, we were restricted to closed, what I like to call closed choice responses. So these are basically questions where you have a list of options, you have to pick one, the traditional multiple choice, and also things where um, a teacher says this is the answer, and a student has to enter that exact answer, or they're wrong. And as we all know, as we all went through high school, um, we know that these are not always the things that are used to teach all subjects. Um, sometimes a teacher just wants to give you an essay. Sometimes the teaching of a, sub of a particular class requires a short answer. Um, and edX needed to develop ways to do this. Um, and I'd like to say they called me first, but I don't think they did. Um, so one way to do this is AI assessment. Um, we've developed several ways to do this, um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards about them because I think they're really cool. Um, but the focus of this talk is AI assessment. Um, so what is AI assessment? Um, AI assessment is the edX term for generic text classification and scoring. Um, so essentially what that is, is you take any text you want, Reddit posts, books and books, whatever, and then you associate them with something, whether that's a score, whether that's a label, um, a label being the author that wrote a book, um, a label could be whether tomorrow is going to be sunny or not. Um, and then we create a model using these um, this text, features we've extracted from this text, and the labels. And that, that model will be able to score future text according to the labeling system we've set up. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to just say, like, I got a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about in this presentation from my work with Kaggle. So if you guys are going to work on Kaggle competitions, I highly recommend it. You'll learn a lot. Um, and before I go into kind of the technical details of this, my presentation does intersect with Nels a little bit. Um, and I'm happy she went first, because now mine makes sense. But that does mean that I'm going to try to skip through some of it as much as I can. So if I'm not reading something, um, that is why. OK, so I talked a little bit about a training set on the previous slide. Um, so this is what a training set is. Let's say that after this presentation, I ask you a question. Why do you want to learn machine learning? Um, so you might give us some responses. Um, I, there are four sample responses I wrote here. That is our training set. That is our four response responses from the survey. And we're going to associate that with a score. Let's say that I also ask you to rate this presentation on a scale of 0 to 2. I hope I get a 2. Um, so based on what you want to learn, that might reasonably affect your score. So the scale of 0 to 2, in this case, defines our targets. And you can see at the very bottom there, I've associated each piece of text with a target. Um, and what we'll move on to doing now is figuring out how to generate our matrices, as Nell pointed out, from this text. Um, so computers have, a, have some disadvantages compared to humans. I know that's tough to believe. Um, but humans basically can look at a sentence and say, this is what that means, just instantaneously. Um, although biologists would probably disagree with me. Um, but basically, a computer needs to be told how to do that. So we need to teach a computer what a unit of meaning is, uh, what that unit of meaning means, and how to put all of the units of meaning together to form a cohesive whole. Um, so in order to do that, we need to break down each piece of text into units of meaning. Um, then we need to contextualize that meaning for the computer, which is putting it into a matrix. Then we need to put that into uh, an algorithm to create a model, which is basically a miniature computer brain saying, these pieces of text, these features extracted from the text, equal this score. 
OK, so the first thing that we have to do is tokenize, break things down into units of meaning. And this is super simple. I've, I've thrown a lot of complex language at you, but really all this is is you take each space and you split it up at each space. Um, that is the simplest form of tokenization. There are more complex forms, um, but for the purpose of this presentation, it's, it's not really necessary. Um, so now we have our tokens from our first survey response here. Um, we can extract sequences of tokens if we want to. Um, this would be called unigram tokens. We can also do bigram tokens, which are sequences of words, uh, two words, and then trigrams, which are three words, and so on. Now, from our tokens, we can construct a bag of words model. Um, so the bag of words model is a common way to represent documents as a matrix. Um, basically, each row is a different document, and each column is a different feature. So basically, we saw these tokens in the last slide. Each token is going to become a feature. Um, and a feature is something that will, that will be able to be fed into the algorithm. So it's an n by t document, document term matrix, where t is the number of unique terms in all of the input text. So each one is a feature. Um, and n is the number of documents. So each little cell here is the count, the number of times that feature, that word, appears in the document whose row it's associated with. And this is, again, the simplest form of bag of words. I'm going to be saying that a lot now, simplest form. Uh, but everything I'm showing you is kind of the baseline, and, and you can build a lot of complexity on top of it, but it's, it's a good framework. Um, so we can see we have our complete matrix here. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about minimizing distance between vectors. So we saw in this last thing, we have words like learning and learning that are spelled slightly differently. Those really mean the same thing. But because of the way the text tokenization is done, the machine doesn't know that. There are two separate features here. Um, so these two text fragments are pretty similar. Bill wanted to grow up to be a doctor, and Bill wanted to grow up and be a doctor, slightly misspelled. Um, so the simple tokenization method we had wouldn't catch this, because the, the machine has no way to understand that these are synonyms. So we can do spell correction. And in fact, if you are following along, I highly recommend this link. I think it's from 04, and it's still one of the best spell checkers I've ever seen. Um, so we can spell correct. And basically what that does is it, it minimizes the distance between documents. So one of the things that we do in machine learning is we try to predict future outcomes from known outcomes. So if I entered this essay uh, or this piece of text, Bill wanted to grow up and be a doctor, and I gave it a score, the next time the machine saw that slightly misspelled version, it would give it a different score. We don't want that. We want things to have things that mean the same thing to get the same score. Um, so we want to minimize the distance using spell correction, and we can lower case, and, and there are other things we can do as well to do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, and this is kind of directly contradictory to the previous thing, we want to preserve information. So what if we spell correct that sentence, but it turns out that a teacher was judging the quality of an essay largely on if all the words were spelled correctly? We will lose that information. It'll be gone if we spell correct it, and maybe we really want to keep it. Um, so what we can do is we can basically create an old set of features, which is our original input text, and a new set of features, which is our spell corrected text. And we can pull out matrices from both of them, and we can put these matrices together to make a larger matrix. Funny how that works. Um, then we can feed that larger matrix into the algorithm. Um, okay. One other thing that we can do um, especially, and this is very useful for text, and it's done a lot in edX ease, is to pull out meta features, like number of spelling errors, number of grammar features. Um, this plays a part in preserving information. Um, it also preserves a part in condensing information. Um, if you're a human and you're given 10 different pieces of information, and all of them have a little bit of relevance to the problem, um, it's not as good as if you get one piece of direct relevant information. It's the exact same thing with an algorithm. You want to try to condense well, let me put it this way. If you know what you're looking for, so if you have a rubric from a teacher that says a student must say the word son or a synonym in their response, um, and you have 100 different words that mean son, 100 different features, um, if you can create a condensed feature that basically says number of synonyms <coughs> for son that occur in the text, then you'll have condensed that and created relevant information. And this goes back to what Nell and Michael were talking about as well. Okay. So how do we find out which features are the right features? Um, just like a human brain, um, uh, an, an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, can get overloaded with features. And when you have a lot of pointless features, or you have a lot of good features that all measure the same thing, you're going to get a lot of issues. 
Um, so there are a few ways to, to kind of determine which features to keep and which not to keep. Um, again, the simplest one is a chi-squared test or a Fisher test. And basically all these do is these split up all of your training examples, so all of your input text and scores. You, you split them up into a high scoring group and a low scoring group. And you try to find the features that significantly differentiate between the two. Um, and significant differentiation basically means that you have a p-value of less than a certain amount, whatever threshold you want to set. Um, so if there is a significant difference, it means that feature X, um, let's say feature X is the word machine being in the essay, it means that the essay got a higher score from a human um, more often, or it got a lower score from a human more often. Um, so we can see in this table each of our words, um, it's associated occurrence in our low scoring texts and high scoring texts, and it's p-value. Um, so we can see a lot of these are actually not particularly useful for prediction. They all have p-values of 1, and the lower the p-value is, the more significant the feature is. Okay, so finally, machine learning. I've been talking a lot, and we haven't got to it yet. And that actually mirrors real life, um, as, as has been pointed out a lot tonight. Um, a lot of what goes into machine learning is the stuff that happens before the actual machine learning, and, it, it, and the stuff that happens after, like generating error estimates. It's really, really critical. Um, so two broad categories of algorithms that we could potentially use are regression algorithms and classification algorithms. Um, and whenever I say regression, I think maybe I use it incorrectly because everyone just jumps on me about linear regression, but I mean algorithms that predict on a continuous scale. Um, so classification would be predicting on a discrete scale. So tomorrow will be sunny, tomorrow will be cloudy, tomorrow will be rainy. Those are discrete things. We can't put that on a continuous scale. Um, a continuous scale, which a regression algorithm would predict, would be the score you got on your assignment was a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Um, it's really kind of strange. Um, I've done a lot of machine learning competitions and a lot of machine learning generally, and there's no hard and fast rule for, at least that I've found, for when to use a classification algorithm and when to use a regression one. Um, generally, I just try both, and I see which one works better. Um, in this case, we will use linear regression because it's the simplest possible algorithm. Um, okay, so a simple linear regression equation is basically just y equals slope times x plus intercept. Um, we all learned that in high school or middle school. Um, so m would be the coefficient here and b is a constant. So what we're going to do instead of that is we're going to expand it out and each feature in the matrix will get its own coefficient. Um, so we'll multiply these coefficients by each matrix row, uh, by each matrix cell, and we'll add them together until we get our predicted score. Um, so these are the coefficients that I predicted for each of these words. And interestingly enough, we can see that the misspelled form did give significant information here. Okay, so now we can predict this. So we have to put the test text, which in this case is this survey response, through the exact same process that we put the training text through. Um, so once you do that, you get this matrix, um, which is just the count matrix for this specific piece of text. And then using our formula, which, which we derived earlier, um, we can predict a score for a test text. And in this case, our predicted score is two because the intercept, as we saw here, was one. And this response has the word interesting in it, which was assigned a weight of one. So that, that resulted in a final score of two. Okay, so this has been said a lot tonight, but I just, I can't stress it enough, so I'm gonna say it again. Um, you need to evaluate the accuracy of your model. It's really, really important. Um, and it's, it's really, it's been built in a lot to ease and discern. Um, and it's really, really hard to develop and it's really, really hard to tell if it's working if you can't actually measure it. Um, so the thing that we use is called cross-validation. Um, it's the kind of the canonical way to do it. So you split each data set into n parts. Um, each part is a fold. Um, so you iterate from one to the number of folds and you take all the data that's in the fold and use it to predict scores for the data that's out of the fold or vice versa. Um, so what it does is it gives you unbiased estimates. If, uh, if a feature vector or a, or a row that we saw in our matrix is in the model, then the model already knows the right answer for that. So if you feed it in again, it's, it's just gonna give you the same answer and it won't tell you how well it's doing. So, Measuring accuracy, really important. If you remember one thing from what I'm saying, that's it. Um, so we're going to use cross-validation on, on, on our own data. Um, so here's the first fold. And I did not do cross-validation properly here just because it was easier for me not to. So I just took the first two 
um, to, to make the first fold and the last two to make the last fold. Um, so these are our predicted scores. And you can see this model, uh, this is the small data, big data argument, although <laughs> even quadrupling this. So this is very, very small data. And that resulted in very, very bad accuracy. Um, so I'm not going to go into these methods of quantifying error because they're not as important as the actual outcome, which is just a number that tells you how well you did. Um, and I highly recommend trying multiple ones of these. Um, but generally, if you, if you do OK on one, you're going to do OK on another. Um, so it's not, it's not as critical in, in kind of a non-competition environment to, to care as much about which one of these guys you're using. OK, so I've talked a lot about the theory behind it. Now we finally get to Ease. So Ease is essentially an open source um, platform built in Python, built with sklearn. Thanks for sklearn. Um, <laughs> that exposes high-level functions for creating machine learning models based on text and then for grading students with those models. So all you feed in is the text and the scores. Um, we've also accounted for rubrics. So you might not just want one score to be associated with a piece of text. You might want to have a whole rubric, a whole set of criteria. So then it'll create multiple models, one for each rubric point. So you can be fed back a lot of targets. Um, so it's it's pretty well tested, if I do say so myself. Um, over 80% coverage. Um, if you do make a change, it'll be really easy for us to tell if it's a good change or a bad change. Um, it's under continuous development. Um, I don't recommend installing it from PIP. Um, I do recommend cloning it and installing it locally. Um, please feel free to pull request, uh, fork it. I'd love to see some contributions. We would all love to see contributions. Um, and you can see code.edx.org for information on that. So discern is the API wrapper for ease. So discern basically, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, so I told you that cleaning up the data and processing the data is a lot more work than the actual algorithm. Doing the other stuff, like making things easily exposable via the web, storing the models properly, ensuring that lots of people can access them, ensuring that they're scalable, these are harder than those two tasks by, I'd, I'd say, an order of magnitude. But I. Um, so essentially what Discern does is it gives you a nice API wrapper. So you can interact with Ease through the web, um, which is language agnostic. You can, you can do it in Python, you can do it in R, you can do it in Ruby. Um, it's also well tested. Um, and it allows you to write the code without worrying about the implementation details that I just mentioned. Um, it also has some additional other nice features, which I'm not going to go into now, but I will go into um, afterwards if anyone wants to talk about it. And this is also on code.edx.org. So we do have a hosted version of Discern. Um, it's in alpha, so no, it doesn't work. What's happening? Please emails. Um, questions should be asked on the mailing list if you have them. Um, and please feel free to go to discern.edx.org and try it out if you want to. Um, this is a simple example of how to connect to Discern and get something done. Um, so requests is just a Python library that, that lets you make web requests easily. Um, and all this is doing is an HTTP GET request to the discern endpoint. And it's saying, um, tell me what I can do with you. Let me know how I can interact with you. So the response comes back. And then you can loop through each of the interaction methods and, and enumerate how to do them. Um, so, so now we can print all of those out. And then we can easily get the way to interact with a single one of these models. Um, and, then, and then do it if we need to. There's a really great usage guide that, that a developer out in California named John Kern contributed. Um, so I highly recommend going to code.edx.org, looking at discern, um, look through the documentation. It's, it's quite good. OK, so there is an example application that I, that I deployed about an hour before I came here onto an EC2 box. So um, it may or may not work. Um, but you can go to it at greater.vicparachiri.com if you want to. This example application interacts with discern. <laughs> to do basic scoring. So it lets you write essays. It lets instructors grade those essays. And then it'll, it automatically scores those essays using Discern's technology. Um, so this is a pretty cool thing to play around with. Um, I'd also like to point out these two. Um, I, I wrote a quick repo to deploy this. So if you want to put this example application on your own EC2 box, you can easily do that. If you want to put discern on your own EC2 box and then interact with it on your own, you also can. There's an edX repository called Configuration um, that uses two amazing technologies called CloudFormation and Ansible to make it super easy to deploy. OK, so I'm going to go through this example really quickly. Um, and if, if you have it up, feel free to follow along. 
Um, what you can do is essentially add a course. Um, and, and I guess before I go into this example, this isn't the end all be all of what it can do. This is just a, a simple usage example. Um, you can use discern for almost anything. The usage test that we have up now is actually scoring Reddit posts to see how many upvotes they'll get in the future. Um, so we can add a course. Um, we can show the problems in that course. And I told you about the rubric. So we can associate multiple rubric options. Um, then we can add an essay. And we can grade that essay as an instructor. Um, so we can see how they did on each of the rubric points. And then we can view our grades. Um, and it will be, if we grade enough, they'll be machine scored and we can see those as well. Um, so just some closing notes on this technology. The Ease technology is used in the edX platform. Um, students are writing questions as we speak that are being scored by machine. Um, they have been, I think, four or five of them run. And there are, there are a few more that are to be run. Um, so this is going to be ramping up as we go along. Um, we would love to have open source community involvement with this. It's really exciting to me personally um, to kind of see an easy, usable way to do this. Um, when I was writing code with Kaggle, it's kind of, you write a lot of one-off code um, and, and it just kind of gets lost and it's not really scalable and it doesn't really get out to the people that need it. And this is a good way to do that. And it's entirely open source and, and I'm sure it can be made better. So that's why it's open source. And that is it for me. Any questions? Yeah, that went up fast. <laughs> Sure. What are some of the harder text domains uh, that are like points for your accuracy? Yeah, I had some great charts that Ned asked me to take out, so I'll Sorry. blame I'll blame Ned for that. <laughs> um, but basically, um, I competed in the Kaggle competitions um, using not exactly the same technology. In Kaggle competitions, what you get to do is you get to go way out on the cost axis. So you get to have a machine that has 64 gigs of RAM, is going to take a week to run. Um, so we don't have that luxury here. But what I can tell you is with substantially the same technology, um, I came in third place in the Kaggle um, long answer competition and first place working with a team in the second one. Um, so we ended up doing quite well in a variety of domains. Um, this particular technology has been um, tested in, in a few domains. We're still kind of analyzing our data. And that's a big part of why it's an API and why it's out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I think I'm locking in in one region. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you have to assemble your annotated data? Do you get your professors to grade a bunch of something else or what? Yeah, so what's that? Repeat the question. Okay, um, so you asked about how we get our annotated data on the edX platform. So these two technologies are basically edX's way of pushing its technology out to the world. So we have an internal thing called edX Open Response Assessor, which you can also find on edX code that's open source. And that gives professors an interface to score things. And that feeds directly into our machine learning algorithm. And what's really interesting about it is, it dis is after it initializes the model and scores everything, it starts to show stuff back to the instructor in order of lowest confidence to highest. So we use something called active learning, um, which ensures that the instructors need to grade a lot less examples to get good accuracy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what feature set are you using? And, and are you familiar with write prints? Can you repeat the last thing? Uh, write prints. Right? Um, no. In some NLP research is considered a gold standard. It's like hundreds of features. Um, Abassi and Chen, 2008 paper. Okay. Um, yeah. um, so you asked, what features are you using? And are you familiar with write prints? I am not familiar with write prints. Um, the features we are using, I would love to discuss with you afterwards. There are a lot of them. Um, and probably won't be able to fit it into this fit this time. Um, sure. In the blue, please. Your prediction just predicting the score of the text, or whether it can enhance your uh, text greater to give feedback, say, how can say, my test be better? How can you improve instead of just a score, say, saying, we start new much. You can say, change this words, change that text. That will be very helpful. Yep, that's why we incorporated the rubric. So basically, the instructor defines the rubric uh, or whoever is using the system, and the system tells you which of the rubric points you hit and you didn't. Um, so that's our, that, that's our feedback mechanism, essentially. Um, yes, sir. Does your system detect plagiarism? Ah, get this question all the time. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so plagiarism is, is a tricky thing to solve. There's internal plagiarism, where there's plagiarism within your system, one student copying from another, and there's external plagiarism. Um, we do not cover external plagiarism. We do cover internal plagiarism. So if a student steals something from his neighbor, then yes. If they take something from Wikipedia, that, that's a much harder problem to solve. Um, and I, the second question you asked was... Okay. Non-English texts can be scored, yes. Natural language, but you also asked about computer programs. So, okay, so I guess there's two things when you're scoring computer programs. You're scoring them to see if they run properly, and you're doing what I just pointed out, the tokenization and seeing if they, if they meet, met some latent criteria. So it can do the latter, not the former. Yes, sir. If you literally score with the bag of words model, then students could conceivably, you know, get get the top score just by hitting all the uh, all the right buzzwords in the manner of the market try. Um, the uh, do you have any features that uh, try to guard against that uh, sort of misbehavior, particularly since the brighter students will discover this? Um, so I guess two points on that. One, the, the presentation what I, that I gave was kind of a simple understanding of this, and there's a lot more complexity in the system itself, although complexity isn't always good. Um, and two, um, there is a difference between the code, the, like the, al the algorithm, and the model. So the professor creates the model. The professor scores the text. So the students have no way of discovering what the, professor, what the professor's latent criteria are. So a student could download the source code, go over it for weeks, and still have no idea how to, how to kind of game that unless they get into the professor's head. Um, Maybe sure. Maybe the re that question is, like, this model doesn't care about word order, whereas word order, at least in English, it carries a ton of information. Um, a unigram bag of words model does not care about word ordering. Um, with, with, um, so we use part of speech sequences and also bigrams and trigrams. So those do care a little bit more about ordering. What do you find is the most effective? Like bigrams. Bigrams and part, part of speech trigrams. Um, sure. So I have, I have a friend who gets paid to write students' papers for them. Like he's not doing any individual. He actually works for a company that, that does this. And I wanted to go back to that plagiarism thing. Now like, um, I, I assume like he has like the same style in all these papers he's writing for everybody. How, how deep does like your plagiarism detection tool? I mean, what's the purpose? <laughs> <laughs> so, in he wants to know if his friend is going to be out of business. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other services that solely concern themselves with plagiarism detection. Like Turnitin is is a good example of that. Um, this is not primarily intended as a plagiarism detector. This is intended as a way for students to enhance student learning. Um, and when we enhance student learning, um, <coughs> we're not really we're, we're, I mean, uh, I'll level with you. I mean, edX offers free online courses. So I'll leave it at that. You said y'all are checking for plagiarism, right? I mean, we know, like, we know about it, but we're not necessarily doing anything about it. We're kind of just logging the data I'm right not now. I'm asking about enforcing it, but just how you, how you guys check. I mean, is it just it's, it's a simple, it's a very simple heuristic. It's, it's all kind of just text matching. Just, yeah. just exact matching and stuff? Not exact, but... Uh, it's a, I, I can go over the heuristic right, with you later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sure. Can this technology be used to uh, take a look at and predict the uh, sentiment analysis? Yes. So the what I'd consider the worst sentiment analysis is the wordless sentiment analysis, where they say if this has the word doubt in it, it gets minus five points. If this has the word hate in it, it gets minus 10 points. Um, the better sentiment analysis that I'd consider is where you explicitly take a piece of text and associate it with a target value. Um, and you can do that with this. Um, provided you have the patience to train the system, um, you could get good sentiment analysis. Sure. Uh, going back to the question of the word model, I know one of the things that they always try to advise going through uh, classes to teach me how to write right, for my Spanish courses. I was talking about like large scale structure in your document. So having being able to put you know your topic sentences here and then having a lot of argument going over the whole course of documents. So not micro not the micro scale that are you writing sentences that are practically correct, but are you able to put your thoughts in a clear position of large scale? So if you're doing it's like the bigram trigram, so you're losing all that structure. Are there ways to be able to incorporate that in your rubric? There are ways to incorporate it into the system, um, not easily. I mean, you need to code it. Um, I mean, it, you can't just go in and click a button and do that. But I will say this. Um, when I took place in these competitions to score long essays, I spent 
I, I don't want to I don't want to say how many hours I spent trying to design systems to to understand large scale structure. It's kind of embarrassing, but oddly enough, they add very little scoring value. Um, I think they add potentially feedback value, and they could be very useful for that end. Um, but that's that's something to be seen. Okay, sure. One last question. Sure. Oh, yeah. uh, when you said patience to train uh, the system with uh, maybe a new model, could you elaborate? Sure. Yeah. I just I meant going through a hundred responses and, and tagging what the sentiment you think is. Oh, okay. I mean, so nothing too. Hard. No. No. It's it's just just if you can read a lot of stuff. I mean, if you're if you're a TA, then I guess you're already set on that front. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dave. Okay, we can hang out here for about 10 or 15 more minutes. Um, all our speakers are here. I'm sure if you have more questions for them, they'll be glad to talk to you. Then we're going to head over to Me Hall. So what's the fire still for?